until Monday. Hope hopefully everybody enjoyed the game, or enjoy the company and the food, or both. Uh, and as they say in the Hunger Games, it may may the odds be ever in your favor. So, with that, uh, we've asked uh, Justin Frazier, who um, heads up the uh, uh, privacy and security. Uh, or get part of uh, Mazer to uh, give us a presentation this morning. Uh, part of what we look to do in this uh, this organization committee is to open it up to more than just the IT side of the street. So you know here we're getting a little bit into uh, uh, some of the preemptive preemptive uh, compliance um, issues that are out there. Uh, what we've also done with this presentation is opened it up to the general membership at large. Uh, given what we'll say is the importance of the topic to uh, to the entire state. So with that, Justin, um, by all means, take it away. Uh, if you want to embellish on your on your background, please do so. Uh, and you're in the driver's seat. And we will ask that everyone put their phones and their uh, devices on mute. Uh, we're going to save a question till the end. Uh, and uh, at this point, Justin, it's all yours. Thanks again. Great. Thanks, Nick. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Good, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for letting me speak today. Uh, so this morning I'm going to speak about the benefits of a healthcare organization building a compliance program in the early stages of development. I wanted to speak about this today because typically, in my experience, a healthcare company only starts looking at its compliance capabilities when an external partner which is most frequently a government agency or a client, ascertains something is wrong about the operations, is angry about it, and sends a threatening letter. At this time, the organization's leaders panic, and to save their contract, their professional relationship, and their credibility, they apologize for the error, promise their angry partner that they will conduct a root cause analysis that involves an operational compliance assessment. The organization leaders then hope and pray that this error was nothing more than a single gaffe and nothing systemic to the routine operations. What I'd like to do to this morning is present the case that the sooner a healthcare organization looks internally at its operational compliance, the more likely it will avoid issues like this down the road. I will also present that building a compliance programming and assessing an organization's own compliance capabilities could also result in potential business growth. Okay, so that's, that's uh, here I'll introduce myself. Uh, this is a picture I found on the internet that I thought looked kind of professional, so I'm gonna use it for myself. Uh, I actually don't know who this guy is, but it does look pretty professional, and it looks like someone who knows what they're talking about. So for, for argument's sake, let's say that's me. Actually, that, that's a joke, that really is me. Uh, I am the Director of Regulatory Compliance at Healthcare Consulting at Mazars, based here in New York City. In my own practice, I provide regulatory and compliance strategies to diverse healthcare organizations from managed care organizations to hospitals, ACOs, IPAs, as well as vendors and tech startups. Before I joined Mazars, I spent the past 12 years working in various operations and compliance roles at many of the New York State insurance companies offering government programs like Medicaid, Medicare, and Obamacare products. So uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, speak today. Let's, let's jump right in. All right. Don't wait for the sanction letter. A healthcare organization's early focus on compliance can serve as a potential growth opportunity and even a competitive advantage in a market saturated with vendors and providers who are vying for the same contract as your organization. As CMS and State Departments of Health continue to prioritize compliance audits for the largest healthcare organizations, potential vendors and providers to these organizations, which I'm gonna assume is most of you in the audience today, will be best prepared to enter into agreements if Prior to contracting, you are able to understand and demonstrate knowledge of your potential partner's regulatory environment, operational compliance to the potential partner's policies, a culture of high ethical and professional standards, and a solution to reduce or eliminate government-issued sanctions for the potential partner. By demonstrating a full understanding of the regulatory environment and its operational requirements, 
It's an effective way to separate a vendor and provider from its peers. The case for compliance. When it takes steps necessary to develop an effective compliance program in its early stages, a healthcare vendor or provider is broadcasting to its employees, consumers, and potential partners that it conducts itself in an ethical manner and in conformance with all state and federal laws. Additionally, a simple documented compliance program as part of the operational structure will help reduce serious operational mistakes and reduce the company's exposure to external investigations. For example, an effective compliance program can reduce the submission of fraudulent claims, the chances of insurance billing audits, unethical business conduct and conflicts of interest, and it will also increase an employee's better understanding of compliance expectations as well as how to respond and report a problem. All right, what exactly is healthcare compliance? I opened the presentation by talking about the benefits of a compliance program, but have not, not yet spoken about what healthcare compliance even is. So I'm going to take a few minutes now to talk about healthcare compliance, where the governing authority for compliance is documented, and how it is enforced. Although every healthcare organization is a legal entity required to follow the laws of its state, healthcare compliance is separate and uniquely different, which is coincidentally why people like me even uh, have a job. Healthcare compliance specifically defines operational requirements and benchmarks that must be met in the delivery of health care to consumers. For example, take an insurance company that's required to determine whether a provider's requested service, like an ultrasound for their patient, is approved or denied. The time that the insurance company takes to respond to the member and provider, what is said in the member and provider communications, and how that message is delivered as well as the appeal process are all documented in a regulation or clearly delineated in a contract that the insurance company has with a large health system or government agency like the State Department of Health or CMS. These, determin these determination requirements to the insurance company are not just some examples of the numerous uh, compliance obligations a healthcare organization and not just insurance companies must oblige to in their daily operations. So where is this all codified? Until 2010, healthcare organizations were not required to document their compliance program. However, with the implementation of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, compliance programs became mandatory for all healthcare organizations participating in government business programs. Specifically, Section 6401 of the ACA requires that healthcare providers, and in the past it was just insurance companies, establish compliance programs as a condition of participation in Medicare, Medicaid, or the Children's Health Insurance Program. I'm going to say as a side note here, although the ACA is specifically for government programs, as most healthcare organizations operate in multiple lines of business, in my experience, they find it easiest to apply a single regulatory standard, which in this case is the CMS requirements for all of their lines of business. So let's talk about how it's enforced. The way CMS and state regulations are read, the insurance company is responsible for policing the delivery of health care for its members. Specifically, CMS and many state regulators required the insurance company to monitor and assure the operational compliance of its directly contracted organizations and also the organizations that contract with the direct contracting organizations. In fact, during CMS and State Department of Health audits, insurance companies are subject to compliance findings if there is a lack of oversight on their contracted organizations or if the contracting organization is found to be in violation of a regulation pertaining to the delivery of health care to the insurance company's members. In my own experience, I've worked for numerous health plans who were cited by a government agency 
for the operational failures of its contractors. Uh, as examples, all of these have resulted in citations or sanctions to an insurance company. A provider's office who is not providing access or, or an answering service to consumers after hours. A vendor who, who is not issuing required member notifications or triggering untimely or non-compliant required member notifications. These operational errors, if identified by a government agency, will result in a citation to the insurance company for improper and provider oversight. All right. So this is how the CMS regulations uh, define the entities that are uh, contracted with an insurance company. And this is what the insurance company has full oversight of. So in the far left, these are first tier entities. This is any party that enters into a written agreement acceptable to CMS with a Medicare insurance plan to provide administrative health care services to its members. So this is the group that's directly contracted with the insurance company, a management service organization, a hospital, an accountable care organization, uh, an IPA, benefit managers, or billing and network vendors. The downstream entity, which is the middle column, is any party that enters into a written agreement with the first tier entity. So these are providers and con uh, providers who are contracted with hospitals and IPAs, and then uh, vendors and, to IPAs as well as MSOs. Uh, the Please third put column, the related entities. Please put your phones on mute, not to disturb our presenter. Oh, thank you. So moving to the uh, far right, the related entity is less common, uh, though it is in the regulations, so I'm going to speak on it very quickly. This is an entity related to a Medicare insurance company by common ownership or control. But the first two columns, uh, I just want to demonstrate that the insurance company is responsible for its direct contracts and the contracts of their direct contractors. So now that we know the insurance company is responsible to serve the police of all of its vendors and providers and enforce CMS regulations, how does an insurance company serve as the policeman? Um, I also want to say that um, although what I'm speaking about is related to CMS and the delivery of Medicare Advantage, again, in my experience, State Department of Health use similar guidelines for Medicaid, and incidentally, insurance companies will adopt this standard for their commercial insurance as, as well. Insurance companies understand that it's their role to assure the compliance of their contracted entities to the best of their abilities, and they often struggle to manage those expectations. A vendor or a provider to an insurance company that does not understand the law or fails to demonstrate evidence of compliance is not an acceptable excuse for regulatory violations. For this reason, it is a common practice for insurance companies to require an annual attestation from their vendors and providers to ensure that they're adhering to applicable compliance program requirements. Additionally, before an insurance company contracts with a vendor provider, there's typically a pre-delegation review or verification to assure that the vendor or provider can meet the regulatory standards uh, and in its normal course of business won't put the insurance company at risk of a compliance violation. If the insurance company has difficulties obtaining information necessary for proper oversight, this will either cause delays in contracting or implementation or in the worst case scenario, cited deficiencies for the insurance company itself during CMS or State Department of Health audits. These uh, failures by a vendor or provider may lead the insurance company to issue a corrective action or carry out some other contractual remedy, like sanctions, probation, or even contract termination. So that is the groundwork with operational compliance and the role of the insurance company to police it. Um, I think I want to talk a little bit now, I want to talk about HIPAA, high trust, and cybersecurity, which is, I'm assuming, an area most of you on the phone are most familiar with when it comes to compliance. Um, 
I want to take a few minutes to speak about this because it's a critical area of compliance that I purposely chose to focus on as a separate area. In the health information world, compliance and data security related to HIPAA are often considered one and the same. Most of the time when you ask a healthcare tech vendor if their organization is compliant, they will demonstrate compliance by providing a list of controls in place to safeguard their protected health uh, information. While it's true that data protection and the rules about maintaining confidentiality are critical, uh, operation uh, are critical operational compliance which is the area I focused on the first part of the presentation I would like to consider something as separate and also equally important so let's um, jump right into HIPAA uh, this might be familiar to most of you on the phone but I'm just going to talk about the his history of HIPAA high trust and cybersecurity as the health insurance portability and accountability act of 1996 or HIPAA went into full effect and cybersecurity breaches become even more pre prevalent, large health healthcare organizations are requiring their potential vendors and in some cases even providers to become Health Information Trust Alliance or High Trust compliant or certified. There's no question that every healthcare organization that stores or exchanges protected health information or other sensitive information with a vendor or business associate must ensure that the information is appropriately and effectively safeguarded. In the past, healthcare organizations have primarily relied on their vendors to either sign in a business associates agreement or verbally commit to their partners that they were HIPAA compliant and have adequate information security controls in place. In addition, some organizations may have provided compliance reports or signed attestations to demonstrate HIPAA compliance. The challenge with this sort of vendor monitoring is that the vendor was never officially certified as HIPAA compliant. As an alternative, organizations have had to use internal resource to perform a self-assessment against the HIPAA requirements or even hire an external assessor to perform an independent assessment to attest that the organization adequately safeguards protected health information. So here comes high trust. In order to provide consistent benchmarks to data security in healthcare, in 2007, a consortium of healthcare organizations came together to form the High Trust Alliance, a nonprofit that is focused on making information protection a core pillar of healthcare information systems and exchanges. High Trust was created to address specific healthcare challenges such as concern over breaches numerous and sometimes inconsistent requirements and standards for data protection, compliance issues, and the growing risk and liability associated with information security in the healthcare industry. The largest healthcare organizations require most of their vendors and, or require all of their vendors and providers to be high trust certified. An increasing number of healthcare organizations, including Anthem, Healthcare Services, Highmark, Humanid, United Health Group now require their vendors to obtain high trust certification prior to contracting. High trust estimates that with these major players in the healthcare world now requiring high trust certification from all of their vendors, there's still approximately 7,500 currently contracted vendors who will need to become high trust certified within the next few years. Today, for most vendors and providers intending to contract with a large healthcare organization, obtaining high trust certification is essential component of business development. Okay, so laid down the ground rules, explained um, compliance, explained high trust, explained that the insurance company is the policeman. So now, as you as the business organization, how do you show a potential partner that you are in the best in class through compliance? Imagine an insurance company tight scrutiny of their vendors and providers, demonstrating knowledge and adherence to their regulatory requirements should be part of the business development plan and included in every vendor or provider's marketing pitch. 
Because vendors and providers are also responsible for complying with all CMS and state public health regulations, best-in-class vendors and providers should, as a first step, build a compliance program that starts with maintaining policies and procedures that cover all of the requirements outlined in the rele relevant regulations in the jurisdiction where they intend to operate. Additionally, vendors and providers must either adopt or acknowledge their partner's code of conduct or have their own code of conduct with the same elements, including a fraud, waste, and abuse plan. In my experience, startup vendors often fail to review the regulatory environment of their potential client. In this scenario, the vendor may propose a product or a solution that either needs modifications to meet the regulatory requirements of their potential partner, or in the worst case scenario, are actually marketing a non-compliant solution. I'm gonna uh, give an example in my own experience. I once worked with a vendor that developed a monetary incentive programs for members to enroll in a specific Medicaid plan. It seemed perfect. The vendor came up with a program that if a consumer chooses plan A with whom they have a contract, that consumer is rewarded with a gift card from their favorite store. Although this seems like a simple and almost brilliant way to encourage members to join one plan over another, in many states an incentive program like this is in violation of the state's Medicaid marketing and solicitation rules. For a vendor to pitch its product without a full understanding of its operational limitations in a specific regulatory environment would certainly result in potential clients or partners questioning that vendor's credibility. So by contrast, implementing a compliance program as part of business development will confirm that your organization is meeting the relevant healthcare requirements in the applicable jurisdiction. The purpose of documenting and completing such a compliance review is to fully assess your capacity to manage and perform services in accordance with state federal laws, rules and regulations, accreditation organization standards, and the requirements of potential partners. Had that Medicaid incentive vendor during its inception phase drafted policies and procedures that were in line with the state's marketing requirements, its leadership would have been aware of the challenges it would face in certain jurisdictions and better understand how to market their product as they move forward and try to grow. The solution or product that the vendor or provider offers to a potential client should not only achieve cost savings through improved delivery, but can also, and this is something to think about, be marketed as a solution to achieve cost savings by reducing sanctions or potential sanctions to your client. I'm going to uh, provide an example right now. So let's go to telemedicine. The obvious pitch for a vendor that offers a telemedicine platform is the telemedicine solution will result in lower administrative costs, increased encounters with provider, and lower cost of care. However, <clears throat> the most resourceful leaders will also understand that their product can assist the insurance company, uh, let's assume that they're intending to market to an insurance company, uh, in achieving CMS and state regulatory requirements around network adequacy, access and availability, and provider directory accuracy. Government agencies have issued numerous citations to insurance companies for not meeting network requirements, resulting in the insurance company being subject to millions of dollars in CMS and state sanctions. Think about this. For certain insurance companies, a product or solution that can reduce government-issued sanctions may be a more appealing reason to contract with a vendor rather than the reduced administrative burdens that the vendor originally intended to alleviate in the creation of their product. Uh, I tell this to my clients all the time. It, it's every, every vendor is going out there to try to reduce costs for their potential, uh, potential client through a business growth strategy. But another way is reaching out to the compliance officer and saying we, our product not only is a way to uh, uh, create gross and reduce and reduce costs, but at the same time, it's also going to reduce millions of dollars in sanctions. 
potentially. So what exactly is a pre, uh, preemptive compliance review that you can do on your own organization to see if you are fully compliant? At its highest level, a preemptive or early compliance review is looking at your own operations to verify whether you can document a compliance program that includes mechanisms to ensure that your organization is operating in accordance with applicable laws and regulations, creating a culture of honesty and integrity, meeting high ethical and professional standards, preventing fraud and abuse and other compliance issues, detecting compliance issues at earlier stages, assuring prompt corrective actions to observe vulnerabilities, creating a culture of ethical and compliant behavior, and building employee trust and confidence. Uh, according to CMS, the implementation of a good compliance program consists of seven core elements. The establishment and adoption of written policies and procedures to promote the organization's commitment to compliance. Identification and appointment within the organization of an in individual to serve as a compliance officer who will be responsible for monitoring compliance efforts and enforcing practice standards the establishment of reporting systems to encourage individuals to make complaints regarding compliance items without fear of retaliation, commitment to conducting formal education and training programs for all levels of employees, ongoing auditing and monitoring of systems to assess the effectiveness of compliance programs and identify issues, development of policies to enforce standards of conduct with disciplinary measures for employees who fail to comply with the requirements, and implementation of corrective action when vulnerabilities are identified. Healthcare organizations should promote a culture of compliance at all levels inside the organization. Moreover, having an effective compliance program is an ongoing process. An effective compliance plan is not a static document, but is proactive, responsive, and changing with the needs of the organization. So the early development of compliance program, which includes a pre preemptive compliance review, is something that can protect a healthcare vendor from a make or break compliance inquiry down the road. In addition, Having assurance that operations are fully compliant with the potential partner's regulatory authority will distinguish the vendor or provider as best in class. To only focus on your compliance in response to an angry letter from a client is an expensive and time-consuming endeavor that could have been addressed much earlier. Currently, there are thousands of healthcare organizations looking to contract with insurance companies or large providers. Building a compliance program early will help a vendor or provider demonstrate that it understands the potential partner's regulatory environment, that its offered services can reduce known and potential sanctions for the larger organization. For this reason, an early focus on compliance is a growth strategy that should not be ignored. So. Uh, Thank you for your time. That was the nuts and bolts of my presentation. Um, it, so what time is it? Yeah, I, we, can, um, we can open up the floor now for questions if anyone wants to ask and we can go into specific details. Justin, thank you for your uh, presentation. We appreciate it. Uh, does anybody out there have any questions? Take yourself off of mute. Go right ahead and uh, jump in and I guess uh, our, our audience has no questions for you at this particular time. Uh, this recording will be put up onto our website. Uh, so anybody, any of your friends, Romans or countrymen would like to uh, view it, uh, it'll be up there for everyone to see. Uh, we appreciate everybody's time here this morning. I guess uh, everybody's wiped out from the Super Bowl, so. Uh, yeah. Tony, uh, Tony, can you hear me? Good, Nick. Yes, I can. Yep. Okay. Yeah, uh, I wasn't really sure. Uh, I was speaking before, but maybe it was muted. 
Justin, what organizations are you seeing having the most challenges in this area? Um, that's an excellent question. So um, to start off with, I want to say um, in my own personal practice, uh, before I joined Mazars, I saw this most with the startup, with the startups. Uh, very often I would see with the tech startups that they come up with a solution, they're able to raise equity. Um, it seems great on paper. They have this great pitch, they raise millions of dollars, they hire, they have a great website. It looks like the, uh, they have a solution to make healthcare delivery much easier. And then as soon as they start to market, there is a lot of hesitation with the actual implementation and contracting because the tech startup doesn't have a full understanding of the regulatory environment that their uh, potential client is working in. So at the end of the day, and, uh, and I gave the example earlier of the Medicaid incentive plan, but I do see this all the time, that there's simply a product out there that is just, is just not meeting the way healthcare delivery is required to be met in the jurisdiction. Uh, and what I would like to point out and the stress is, uh, if you develop your policies and procedures early and do this regulatory and compliance review at the get-go, I want to say the tech startup, they, they do compliance regarding the high trust and, the, and safeguarding data integrity, but when it comes to operational compliance, it's just something that they assume that their product will fit into naturally, which is not the case. The other area that I see is on the insurance end, where the insurance providers, the, the biggest area and where I see the most sanctions is they are continually getting uh, cited by government agencies for the errors of their directly contracted entities. And this is called the vendor oversight. Uh, in all of the insurance companies that I work for and work uh, known personally, it's every year where there's a state audit, the citations, the vast majority of citations come from the vendor, vendor or provider oversight where the vendor is suddenly uh, going off the rails, implementing or doing something non-compliant that's not ascertained until the state or government audit, and then the insurance company is, is fully at risk for that vendor's errors. All right, thank you, I appreciate that. Welcome. Other questions for Justin? Hi, uh, um, how, does, how does the health plan do when it comes to Article 40, 49 um, with the state and, and in terms of in compliance? Is there a lot of citations? Um, they're, they're not complying with, with, their, with their program? So, yeah, by mentioning Article 49 is, so uh, for people on the call, Article 49 oh, is the utilization, 44. I'm sorry? Do you want 44 or 49? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll go 44 oh. or 49, all right, we'll go, we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll mention both. Um, Article 49 is the utilization review requirements uh, beholden to insurance companies operating in New York State. That one is a, is a perfect example of uh, citations being given to the insurance company for their vendors because very often uh, an insurance company will delegate their utilization review, especially in a specific area like um, prenatal utilization review or something, or something for HIV, something very specific it's delegated out and the vendor con continually makes errors. So enforcing that is extremely difficult. Article 44, which you also mentioned, is the general insurance operation requirements for uh, all Medicaid plans in New York State. But this is, I'm glad you mentioned 44 because 44 is also required, it was implemented in other regulations, so it's required for commercial as well. And these are all of the requirements for the operations of the insurance plan not related to medical. 
And again, it's the same issue. It's the vendor being hired. The vendor makes a mistake, and ultimately the insurance company is the one who is accountable for the vendor's error. It's, um, Any other questions? I know it's, it's compliant. It's a little bit heavy, but it's uh, fun stuff. Other questions for Justin? Okay, if not, Justin, thank you so much. I appreciate uh, you taking the time this morning and um, putting together this presentation. I'm very, very uh, thorough and uh, we will make sure that Tony gets the recording out uh, to the uh, general membership, um, but we can't thank you enough. Appreciate it. Tony, anything to add? Well, look. Yeah, we want to last note anybody that's up in the Albany area on the 12th of this month uh, at the uh, Marriott on Wolf Road, we're going to have a, an evening uh, dinner event. Uh, if you can attend, we'd love to have you up there. Uh, Nick will be moderating a panel that will be talking about the integration of mental health into the healthcare scenarios. So we look forward to seeing everybody who can make it up there. All right. Thanks again, everyone. Thank down, you, Justin. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry. One other thing, thank you. Yeah, one other thing I'd like to point out is anybody going to the Orlando conference, we have the registration link open for our luncheon, and this year we're doing – a donation of ten dollars that'll go out to a charity. So, uh, where in years past we've had the lunch as a freebie, uh, this year we're doing it with a ten dollar donation to uh, help a couple of charities. So please sign up, come and join us. Uh, in years past, we've had in excess of three hundred people in the room. It's a great networking opportunity. It'll be held on Wednesday, March eleventh, from eleven to one p.m. Nick, yeah. I'm done. All right, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day and a great week. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.